Hello and welcome to the first ever 7NWA podcast and we've kept this one back, it's a special one. Um, joining me is Paul Dalgleish and Paul is going to take us through um, what we've called Jurgen Klopp from Dousers to Believers, which is basically a look at Jurgen Klopp, how he was recruited and his time as Liverpool manager, which is just super exciting. Um, Paul, I mean, do you want to give us a bit of background on, on the actual presentation? Yeah, well... Basically, I think that, you know, he's he's on the edge of, he's already great. He's going to go down as a legend. And, but, you know, it's it's about savouring every moment that we've got with, with the manager. But I wanted to go into a little bit of detail, try and, you know, with, with 7NWA, um, we want to try and give you, give you information that maybe wasn't possible before. So um, I want to go through the process of why he was chosen, um, and what makes him what makes him special? Brilliant. Okay, well, we'll crack on, eh? Yeah, um, I'm, on. I'm looking forward to this. I've seen a little preview of it, and it looks good. So, yeah. And I must say, Gab, before we start, I've stolen some pictures off other people's uh, <laughs> presentations that they've done. So, if you see, if you see the, uh, if you see your picture, thank you. <laughs> okay, so. Um, why was he why was he considered um so i think when when liverpool were going through the the process um of what they needed in, in a manager they needed because of the level of data and analytics that um that they use they wanted to make sure they had somebody that was used to working with a technical director and somebody that was comfortable uh working alongside um working alongside or working for a team that were where the manager was part of a process not not the most not the not not everything could be his decision um so they, they actually they actually had a short list of three players is my understanding uh, sorry three managers is my understanding Jurgen Klopp uh Ancelotti and uh Diego Simone um so that was that was why uh, he was considered, uh, and also another part which I'll get into later was the uh, FSG at the time. It's it's uh, it's New England Sports Ventures now, but they they, um, they wanted to have somebody who had a playing style that would increase the value of the club, and also have a a personality as a manager that was popular that would increase the value of the club as well as, as win games. So I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, so as I said, I'm going to go and why is it considered? I'll, I'll go through the interview process. Um, I'll go through his management style, his tactics. And then obviously I think one of the biggest success stories has been the recruitment. Um, so I'll, I'll go over that as well. So, Liverpool were looking for someone who was willing to follow the analytical strategy of the club. Um, somebody that had a personality and playing style that increases the popularity value of the club. A history of developing players. Uh, tactics that, that would resonate with Liverpool supporters. Somebody who would work with a recruitment department. Um, and then somebody that had honesty. Um, and these were all the, the key factors that, that they were looking for. In the next manager, so FSG believe that no single person could could be king, and believe that better decisions are made when multiple brains are in the room, using data and analytics. So Jurgen was used to working with a sporting director at Dortmund, so that's why uh, he was on the very short list to to be considered. Um, so when Liverpool when Liverpool were looking at the candidates, the research was done on on the performance at, at last clubs and, and now it's a lot more prevalent in the game expected goals expected threat analytical uh, tools like that but Liverpool uh, didn't just look at how many points he got they actually looked uh, at the expected points that he should have got and in his early years at Dortmund he won titles but even in his last season in Dortmund the team were really unlucky uh, massively underachieving their expected points. Um, so they didn't have that as a negative. 
for for Jurgen. They they said that if that season had been played a thousand times again, that Dortmund would have had a lot more points. Um, and actually, when he went to when he came to Liverpool, he sat down with Ian Graham, and, and this is a, a a public story that he sat down with Ian Graham, and Ian Graham was talking to him, how did you lose that game uh, against whoever it was. And Jurgen was going, oh my God, I can't believe we, we lost that game. He said, oh, what, did you see this? But he goes, no, I've never seen the game. It was all data and analytics That's for you. Right. So I can, they, they, they analysed all his games. And then the main thing was the analytical approach that younger players have the potential to increase in value and therefore increase the value of the club. So the manager had to have a willingness to sign and play young players and the average age of the Dortmund team that won his first Bundesliga was 22.7 years old. And it had players like Lewandowski, Hummels and Gotze, who have obviously gone on to have incredible careers. Lewandowski was probably the best player in the world last year. So um, the, the, the fact that he was willing to play young players and, and not just play them, but improve them and increase the value was, was another major consideration. So... Then the interview process. So the, the first meeting was at a dinner with, with Ian Eyre that took place in New York. Um, obviously, if, if Liverpool were looking for a new manager, it would be very difficult to keep it private in England. So they actually met their candidates in New York. Um, uh, the, the second meeting was with the leaders of, of Fenway, who are all really, really different. Uh, very, very different personalities. Like John Henry's quite quiet, quite insular, you know, and then there's there's others that are a little bit more outgoing. So it was important that the manager could engage and interact with, with all the different personalities and connect with them. Um, and then during the interview process, Jürgen's humility and, and honesty was clear, but also his ability to be tough if needed, which was which was another thing that was was really important. Can this person stand in front of can this person stand in front of players and, and tell them the truth? Can can he? And and I think we've seen over the over the years, we've been lucky enough to see that Jurgen's brilliant, not just at uh making players feel great about themselves and perform, but also uh holding them accountable when when needed. He, he, he's ruthless. But the most interesting thing for me, and what really I think makes him special, was when they decided it was Jurgen. He went for a walk in New York, left his agent to negotiate the deal, and he made one demand. He said uh, he asked that one figure would be negotiated for him and his two assistant coaches, as he didn't. He felt Liverpool would never value them as much as what he did. Uh, so they negotiated one package for him and his two assistants, and he made them the two highest assistant, uh, two highest paid assistant coaches in the Premier League. Mad that. Isn't it? Right. I mean, especially after um, your, your man left, didn't he? That's it, and um, I think that's why that's probably why it hurt him so much, you know? Yeah. Um, because he, he did he, he did look after his his staff in a, in a very special way, and I'll get to that later. So, Mike Gordon, uh, at the time, after the meeting, said it was clear that Jürgen, and I stole this from someone, Gav, I must admit. So it was clear that Jürgen, as a football coach, was on the same level as a company boss, like a man you would trust your company to. So they were looking for this like CEO, charismatic leader that could that could make Liverpool popular in every corner of the world. And, and I think he's certainly done that, Gav. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, what he also did, his personality, was he made Liverpool more uh, more appealing to sponsors. He, he increased, because he is the face of Liverpool and he, he is the voice of Liverpool, he made he made Liverpool more um, appealing to sponsors. And, you know, so heads of massive companies were actually wanting to come to Liverpool and, and meet with Jürgen. And I think that you saw, even coaches in other sports, the... the the basketball coach at the, the Golden State Warriors, um, he references Jurgen as a as a as a figure that that he emulates as well. So it was, I mean, it, the impact that he's had not just on the team but on growing the the value of Liverpool in all corners of the world is incredible. 
It's mad that, isn't it? How much goes into it. So these are this is his first press conference, Gavin. It was if you look here in in his first press conference uh, with the and Air. I mean, they've gone on to be iconic, but he, what he said, I think, I, I think it might be the best ever press initial press conference of of any manager, I would say, and and I highlighted a few bits of it. This was uh, this was, and I'll just shut up and, and let you let you listen. Hold on. No, so let me work. I'm a totally normal guy. I came from Black Forest. Um, um, my mother maybe sit in front of the of the television and, and watch this press conference. and understand no word until now. So, and but she's very proud. She's very proud. So I'm a totally normal guy. Um, I'm the normal one, maybe if you want this. <laughs> Yeah, which was brilliant, wasn't it? Because it was just after Mourinho called himself the special one. And I think that was that was exactly what we wanted to hear as Liverpool fans. Yeah, that totally ingratiated himself with us. You know, we thought, you know, what a what a guy sort of thing, didn't we? Yeah, amazing. Uh and like it, it really, really was incredible. It was an incredible press conference. I remember calling my dad after and saying, Dad, did you see the press conference? And he was like, Oh my god, this guy's brilliant. And I was like, Yeah, amazing. It was it was just honesty, Gav. Confidence and honesty was just oozing out. He didn't need to give you any bullshit. Didn't need to. He didn't need to, you know, try and pretend he was something he wasn't. He was just brilliant. And then, obviously, this is the big one, hey. So, the song that's going around at the moment, the Beatles song, is brilliant. But he, he you know, people, he, he, people mention about doubters to believers, but he also did tell us that he was going to win a title within four years, and he did. Yeah. And and if you think about the, the team that Liverpool had then, for him to have the confidence that he was going to do that is incredible. And then not only to have the confidence, but to deliver. Like, incredible. So, you want to hear that? Go on. But um, it's only important that we play our own game. That we that the player feel... The confidence and the, the trust of the people. If uh, yesterday I spoke to LFC TV, it's a real important um, thing that um, that the player feels the difference from now on. Of course, they have a new coach from another country, all the things, but they they have to to think that they can reach the expectations of all the other people, of all the fans, of all the, the press or whatever. So, if somebody wants to help LFC, you have to change from to believe it. It's a very important thing. That's a... Yeah, that was that was probably the bit that everybody remembers the most. Well, he inherited a club at the time that that had a really, really poor season under Brendan Rodgers. Obviously, 13-14 had been outstanding, but we'd made some bad signings. Lost Luis Suarez. Sterling wanted out as well. Um, or gone, actually, by the time Jurgen came in. And it was, it was, it was an unhappy place, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, no, and I think it was on. It, the, the fans were were really split as well at the time, weren't they? You had people that liked Brendan and people that didn't like Brendan, and and especially everyone was torn a little bit because that season, when we had the the Suarez, Sterling, and and Sturridge front three was honestly made one of my most enjoyable seasons that I've watched Liverpool yes. with Tino as well, Gerard, yeah. uh, Jordan Henderson, and that. I mean, it was brilliant. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the football we played was incredible, and it was just, just really disappointing that that we never kicked on from there, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but now, I mean, that's the difference. Now, he, he, there is no doubters amongst the fan base. There's no split, even when we went through a hard time last year. Nobody that cares about Liverpool had any concerns that this wouldn't turn around when when the when the centre backs came back to the team and. Well, that's now the interesting we're... thing about last year. There was never, ever in the press anyone mentioning about Jurgen Klopp leaving. No. And certainly amongst the fans. But the press are normally bang on it, aren't they? Yeah. And, you know, yeah, no managers to win two defeats away from getting the sack. And he, he was never questioned. No. And rightly so. Mm. Why would you? So the uh, this is where he, he goes on about the title. A special Liverpool way. We can be successful, but we can wait for it, of course. But we, I don't want to say we have to wait the next 20 years and I'm sitting here again. I, I know when I'm sitting here in four years, I think we won one title in this time. I, I'm pretty sure. 
if not the next one, maybe Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> He's brilliant, though, isn't he? He's brilliant because he was just so calm about it. You know, we'll win a title, and if I don't, I'll be working in Switzerland. <laughs> but he, he he comes from he comes from a place of utter self belief. Yeah, and he doesn't yeah, have to prove anything to anyone. It's no secret, though. It, mm. It's you know, what I mean, he, he's he, it, it's not by chance. He's a hard working guy, and with you know, blue collar values, he's yeah, he's just he's just special, isn't he? So, so uh, one of the other things, Gav, that that kind of he spoke about was he hires experts and lets them do the job. You know, where we you've got managers that are terrified of giving other people power because they they think it it weakens them. But he's the complete opposite, where he wants the people around him to be happy. Um, and it, it it means he must give them confidence in what they do. And he says, one of the, as I said, one of the greatest strengths of strong personalities is to surround yourself with people who are stronger than you in certain areas. So what he actually did was he went to, to Bayern Munich and got uh, Andreas Kornmeier, who was from Bayern Munich, uh, that absolute top top level at what he does, but at the time when it when he signed Mona Nemer, he, he actually said that that was that was his only ever world class signing, which is mad, and that's and that's how that's how important he uh, that's how important he he feels his staff are, and as I said, he, he's not scared to surround himself with people that. Um, that know more than him in certain areas, but also leave them alone to do the job, Gav, without mm, yeah. interfering. And that takes a that takes a lot of kind of humility and confidence in yourself. And that's that's what he's all about. He was laughed at when he brought in a throwing coach. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I think even if you look at the data, our, our numbers on throwings are it's improved. It's mm. improved. The, it's improved the team. So you know. If you think how many throwings there are a game, then it's it's just it, it might only be. And what what I always think, Gav, is even you, you look at the you look at the the when we finished second in the league to Man City, it was one point right between the two teams. Is that right? When we finished second, yeah. So you think about it. It's one. How many of those games were decided by one goal or less? So say it was only one play in a game where you got the benefit from hiring someone like that. That yeah. could be the difference between you winning the league or not. It's going to be the same this season, isn't it? Yeah. You know, yes. it's neck, neck and neck again. So it like really a, you know, is. That, that, really that, is. Season, that season, Mo Salah had a ball that was like 10 millimetres yeah. not across the line or something. That, that's the that's the margin you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, mate. And that's it. You've got to try and where can you find these marginal gains? And he looks for them everywhere. Mm -hmm. Despite you know, even if it's even if it's new or not really been done before, he's got the confidence to know that it's the benefit for the benefit of everyone at the club. So it, he always asks for for the feedback of of all the staff, but the final decision uh, is always made by him. So, you know, they know, everybody that works with them knows who who's makes the final decision. But he's amazing at including everybody in, in getting to that decision. Which is leadership, right? Yeah. So, he likes to make people around him happy, as you said. And, and not, just, not, just, um, not just the players and uh, his staff, but everybody. So, after games... He, he wouldn't do his, his post-match interview until he'd hugged everyone in the tunnel that worked for the club. So whether it was media, uh, front office workers, and they've, they've got a mantra, which is together stronger, uh, together strong. And then there was another example, Gav, when uh, he was asked, um, he used to have an all-staff meeting. Because Liverpool's based in different locations, you've got the Liverpool City Centre location. You've got the London office. And you've also got the uh, Melwood and the stadium. Kirby now. Kirby, yeah. But by the time it was Melwood. And yeah. because they were all in different locations, uh, 
there were some people that didn't know who did what. You know, it, it, the, the clubs evolved from everyone reporting to Anfield and then going to, to Melwood and coming back. So they'd have a they'd have a, a meeting each quarter for the front office workers that uh, just to come to Melwood or they go wherever, just so everybody could get together and get to meet each other and uh, create that bond, really. And, and when Jürgen was asked to attend, he asked if the players attended too. And in the past, the players had never gone. And he said, they need to go. So he, Jürgen, Jürgen asked all the players to go um, and introduced themselves to all the front office staff. So the front office staff and the players came and they, they all went around and introduced themselves and uh, they found out who the staff were. And that, you know, when you see it, when you see things like that, what a deal he makes out of everybody at the training ground, you understand why everyone's so happy because, as you said, he, he really feels that everybody has a part to play. Yeah. And then what one person said when I was kind of doing my research, they said that when you go into a room with Jürgen, and I can tell you this myself, mate, when I went to, to Melwood to train, and it, it, you do come out feeling better. You know what I mean? He's got that big smile, the big hug. He's massive, and he just makes you feel better about yourself. Uh, it, it really is like it's that that unknown quality, you know, that he's got to just making you feel good about yourself, uh, which is, you know, you see that, don't you, with the players? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see that. And then when, when he first in, arrived at Liverpool, he learned the names of everyone that work at the training facility, the cooks, cleaners, groundsmen, and then introduced them all to the players. So he'd have them all come out. Uh, he'd have them all come out and he, he, he knew the names and would tell the players who they were and what they did. Brilliant. So he also only signs good people. So he'll have conversations with players before he signs them. And if he do, if they don't fit the personality, if he doesn't connect with them, then he doesn't sign them. Uh, he, and he, his line was to have a complete idiot with you just because he can kick a ball a little bit better is totally annoying. And, and there's an example of that. So when he, when he signed Jeannie Wijnaldum, uh, Jeannie was taken aback when he met with Jürgen before he signed, when he had more interest about where he'd gone on holiday than football because he he cares about the person, not just the footballer. Mm. So he wanted to know everything about his holiday. What was it like, his family? And, and you know, it's, to be honest with you, mate, that, that, that creates that emotional connection as well as that football and respect because, you know, Footballers are human beings first that just so happen to play football. Yeah. But you've got to deal with the you've got to deal with the human first. And and he's he's the best in the world, that's it for me. Mm. So in in terms of what's important to him, he, he places a huge importance. And we've seen some of the videos on Liverpool TV where it's grueling pre-season. But he feels players that miss pre-season due to internationals. Or, or injury, struggle to catch up. And that's where he does a lot of his tactical work. Now, if you if you think about it, Gav, John, a season at Liverpool, playing in four competitions and sometimes more, if you know, in years where we've won the, the European Cup, then you don't actually have that many days to train between games. So he, he places a huge amount of importance on, on learning the system in, in pre-season. Um, he tells them that I'm your mate, but I can never be your best mate because I can only pick 11 plays. Uh, he, most of the training is, is in 11 v 11 in big spaces. And it's main the main focus is on the de defensive side plus the transition moment. Okay. Um, and then focusing on compactness and how to press the opposition. Most of it comes from, most of the training comes from the opposition have the ball. What do we do? Um, he gives players unbelievable amount of freedom in attack. But in defence, that's where the non-negotiables come. So that was, I, I remember seeing uh, Thierry Henry talking about Pep and he said, yeah. Pep gets you to this line here, which was about yeah. a third of the yeah. way inside yeah. the opposition half. And then he went, that's the bit that you use your talent. Well, that's what he said. My, my job is to get you into the final third. Your job is to score. Yeah. Uh, but you'll see, uh, uh, yeah, I've got a little video coming up where Jürgen talks about uh, his tactics. 
so that that'll be that'll be cool to see Gav um, in a minute, and he, he'll tell you the attacking side where right. there's so much flexibility for the players. Um, and then what what the, another thing that they do is players that don't do a high in, uh, players that don't play do a high intensive session the next day, uh, and they used to use that as a as a chance to introduce the top young players to see how they adapt to the higher intensity. So that the day after a game, there was like a, a really intensive session for the ones that didn't play and also a chance for, for, for the staff to look at some of the younger players. And when you see the integration of the younger players into the team, you can see that there's a process that's followed. That's really and interesting. Pep Linders, that is, uh, he's kind of, or was the, the lead in that. So, uh, Basically, Liverpool believed when they were hiring him, as I said earlier, that an attractive playing style uh, increases the popularity and the value of the club. Um, so what Jürgen said, football is theatre. If we don't play a great game, there'll only be two people left sitting around at the end. Uh, and I, I think we can all agree that even at the beginning, Gav, when the results weren't what they are now, the team's always been really enjoyable to watch. Yeah, really enjoyable to watch. So this is him. This is him, Gav, and the importance of, of counter pressure. Obviously, when we get to the tactics now, is one of his main things he's known for is gag and pressing and counter pressing. So here he he he, he talks about why uh, counter pressing or gag and pressing is better than any number ten or playmaker that you can ever that you can ever sign. We want to talk a little about some of your football philosophies, Jürgen. Everyone talks about the counter-press, the, the Gagan press when they talk about a Jürgen Klopp team. You, you said this, uh, Gagan pressing is the best playmaker. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, usually think about what you have to, what we have, what have to do until you bring a player on the number 10 if you want to play make in a position where he can make the decision for a genius pass or not. So you have to play a few passes, your channel balls, whatever. And the counter pressing makes it exactly the same. So you win the ball back on a high, a high on the pitch and uh, you are close to the goal. So it's only one pass away from a really big opportunity most of the time. And that's why I said, okay, you know, playmaker in the world can, yeah, can, uh, can be as good as a good counter pressing situation. So yeah, that's only to to show the players a little bit how, why it's so important. And um... makes sense, right? So yeah, the, the other thing as well, Gav, is so say say you've got a number ten and he's on the ball. The opposition are normally organised because you've got possession, so they'll be organised. The other great thing about Liverpool showing inside and trying to win the ball centrally in, in these positions is the opposition are normally at the most expansive because they've got the ball. So you've actually got a small window of time in transition to take advantage of a disorganised opposition. So it, it, the, it, it, is, it is, there's a lot more to it than just pressing. The, the advantage that you get is the state of the opposition in that moment as well. Yeah. So here he talks, here he is, mate. And this is how important it is to him. I don't know if you remember this, but this was in the whole game when uh, it was right at the beginning of his, his time. At, we won 5-1, uh, didn't we? Yeah. And, 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 from the right, which is a right, yeah. right wing, right, right side of the attack. He's even coming across now. So you've got good press and you lose the ball and then you get this again. Yeah, it's 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 like it is. You, a, a, a lot I'm of it. <laughs> Obviously, I'm, I'm a little bit more excited about it than, than all the rest around. Uh, Did you get satisfaction from that? As so much as a goal? Yes, it is. Yeah. It is a small goal if you want. You win a ball back, maybe not this situation, but it shows that we are on the right way, and you always need to be to try to come on the right way, and then you can use it. And it's easier to find um, the, the, the the if you want the. Yeah, the goal. And, and, and so I'm, I really love situations like this, not because of it, only because I know what it means for the game in general. If you're in this mood, yeah, it will work. So he's saying it's more than pressing, right? It's, it's about, it shows that you're in the mood to play. It's a mindset. And it it's amazing, isn't it? How, you know, now you see everybody like going on the pitch and hugging players and celebrating tackles and, and but... He was really one of the first ones to do it. 
and now it's he, people of him I, are emulating him. He uh, he did that in the game um, at the weekend. It, the, there yeah. was a situation because of where we sit, which is just behind yeah. him. I always see him do that yeah. that sort of thing. But there was a situation very similar to that. And I can't remember who it was. Someone went flying in on the line, won the ball, and we were back. We we had the ball again, and he lost it. He's gone. He's like, you know, it's literally like scoring a goal for him. It's, and it's brilliant to watch. Do you know what I mean? Well, what happens as well is now there's fans in the stadium again. The, the fans, when they see him doing that, they celebrate it as well. And then the players want to make the fact they want to feel good. They want the fans' yeah. adulation. So there's a there's a knock on effect of it as well. Then the, yeah. now the fans are going to do it more. Uh, sorry, then now the players are going to do it more. So it, yeah, there's a method to the madness. So then this is more about the attack and freedom. So we, we speak about a lot about how Liverpool play and, and you know, the, the flexibility that they've got. So might as well hear it from the man's mouth himself. When we talk about uh, your formation, sometimes we might say oh, Liverpool are playing one up front today, but do you actually look at it and say, we're actually playing four up front? I actually don't think about it. Yeah, to be honest, it's not about it's not that I think about if we have now a false nine or no nine or um, or what that is. We, these players are all responsible to be in the box in the opposite opposite box um, in all situations they can be. So of course, not the centre halves. I would have like to have them only around set pieces there. And there's always one holding player that can be a fullback, that can be a midfield player. That's not too important. But all the rest, it's not that they say, Bob, I couldn't I score. Somebody told me that's all about being so flexible. possession, almost three seven. Three, yeah. three players who are. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> read this. <laughs> no, it's not. We again, we again in possession. Yeah, it can, it can be everything. So it's um, that's right. It may be in possession here in the, in, the, in the other in the other half. You can do it. it. It's like this. You have only you have only this these positions. It could be everybody. Let me see this. Do we have time for this, or yes. are we already under pressure? No problem. Eh? I can stop immediately. So it's not important. And now we have to send the hearts. Come on here. Now we have to. This is the, uh, the situation. And let me say this is the six because they leave up one striker. So that's not important which players are this. Are, it's absolutely not important. So it's not important. Everybody can be. So Sadio Sani could be here, of course. So that's how it is. And here can be Adam Lalana, for example. That's not important. It can be here or can be here. This can be Roberto, this can be Stooge, whoever. So that's the only thing. But it needs time, time because the problem is you lose the ball and now everybody looks on his back. Oh, I'm offensive player, don't defend. So wait what happened, bring me the ball back. And that's what we have to, to create that we are then. And that's what I loved in the first half against against how we were that flexible, we were that, all that, and then losing the ball and then it was really wild boys and and, and 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 i loved it in this moment so it's amazing gav right that the the amount of flexibility that the player's got he always needs width he always needs one holding whether it's a fullback or a, a defensive midfield player which is fabinho now most of the time but everybody else and you see that has the the flexibility to go wherever they want i think sometimes now you see salah wide and trent inside and then you see Salah inside and Trent wide and the same on the other side. Henderson out wide, don't you? From wide, yeah. right, don't you? All That's the time. It. He always needs width. Um, but the, the structure in the middle has has flexibility. And and the people that can give the width has flexibility as well. But the, the key, Gav, is, as he said, is everybody's got to understand the transition moment. Because if, 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 a, if a midfielder has rotated with a forward and the forwards now in a midfield spot uh, in the transition to defence moment, then the forwards got to defend like a midfield player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's that's what takes time. That's what takes time. You know, it, when I was coaching, I played a, a very similar way myself. And it, it takes time, Gav. It takes time for, for, it to, for it to become natural for the players. And it took, it took Liverpool... A few years, right? And mm. a lot of transfer windows to get to where we are now. But there was go on. Sorry. No, but the the the, the principles have remained the same. There was a game in the Champions League group stages where there was a corner for us, broke down, they got in transition, and the person who defended it at centre back was Mo Salah. 
Yeah, you see him and, do that a lot, mate. And I was, I was gutted that no one picked it out. No one spotted it. No, it wasn't on the telly. No one put it on Twitter as a little thing. And I, were, I was actually going to look for it. But yeah, exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, and that's it. And he does it often, quietly. You see him chasing back a lot because I think he's on the edge of the box on corners. So if we did, if we do get caught in transition, it, he he's got the pace to track someone as well. Mm -hmm. So um, recruitment, Gav, I think is just the last bit. Uh, so basically, when when Liverpool uh, when Liverpool um, making it, the dogs are, I think the dogs are going mental. I think they'd get in a Jurgen Klopp team the way that the. The aggression are showing there, Gav. Uh, so, Liverpool, in my opinion, have one of, if not the best, recruitment departments in the world. Um, and, Gav, can you can I pause this, or is it no? I'm going, all right. Well, you're just going to have to deal with the dog then. Um, Liverpool, <laughs> Liverpool have one of the best. One minute. Oi. Good, hey? Good. Kids don't listen. Here they come. Come on. Come on. Up. Come on. Mate. So, anyway, Liverpool, back on track, professional Gav. You know what I mean? <laughs> Liverpool have one of the best recruitment departments in, in world football. Um, and what they do is they... So, basically, and this is this is the thing that I don't think people understand is what they do is they Liverpool rank the players in terms of... So, say they're looking for a left-back. They will rank the players from from one to ten and present them to to Jurgen uh for him to for him to choose which one he wants. Um and the interesting thing about that is that Liverpool have always done this. Liverpool have always done this. So the difference now is Liverpool can now sign number one on the list, number two on the list, or number three on the list, because everybody wants to come to Liverpool. Whereas when he first started, you know, Ian Eyre was still there. Michael Edwards, sorry, uh, Ian Eyre was there. Michael Edwards was there. Uh, Ian Graham was there. You know, Barry Hunter was there. They were all still there. They were still identifying the same players. Yeah. yeah. But the players didn't want to come to Liverpool because we, we didn't have that appeal that we've got now. We were so, in, we were competing with Dortmund, Tottenham for players. And now we're above them, snatching the players off them. That's it. Now we're buying their players. Yeah. 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 So, um, so basically after a, after a settling in period uh, and assessing the, the playing, the playing staff, he, he decided on the style of play. So he always says that the, the style of play is based on the players. So he picked the way of playing, which at Dortmund he played more 4 2 3 1. And at Liverpool it's been more 4 3 3. Um, so what, what he did was when he decided the way that he wanted to play, he created the player profiles with right. uh, with Michael Edwards to give everybody in the academy and everybody in the recruitment department uh clarity. And this might sound, I'm gonna go a little bit Ted Lasso here, Gav, but one of the one of the analogies that I use is 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 use light, right? So you've got you've got light, uh, and you can have a floodlight that uses electricity to produce light, and it it can light up an area, but it's the lights going in all different directions. Whereas you've got a laser which points the light in one direction, and it can cut through metal. and And I think when you keep changing managers and the managers or the manager, even if you keep the same manager, but the manager keeps changing the way they play, you're using a floodlight approach. See Whereas I Everton, think, you? you see it at Everton, you see it at Man United over Man the last United. few years where they chase success. You see it. So for me, one of the most important things that, um, that, that has attributed to the success of the recruitment that we've had in the last few years is the fact that Jurgen Klopp hasn't changed the focus on what a Liverpool player looks like and how what they need to play for him. The profiles haven't changed. The academy players know who they need to emulate to get into the to get into the team. Mm. And and people don't talk about that, Gav. We've played 4-3-3 now for how many years? 
Yeah. His whole time, right? So that that's that's um that's his uh I think that that deserves a lot of credit as well. His, yeah. his consistency and even when things haven't gone well, he's not tried to reinvent the wheel. He's this is the way Liverpool play. And and if you're looking ahead now, past Jurgen Klopp, Liverpool need to hire a coach now that we have an identity Liverpool needs to hire a coach that will continue to play the Liverpool way uh, yeah. their own twist on it by all means but play the Liverpool way um, he has the first and last say on transfers as long as it works financially so no player comes into Liverpool without him and he spoke about that no player comes in without his final say so um, the other thing that, that is really interesting about him Gav is that he doesn't expect perfection. Uh, he, he, he believes that there's no perfect player profile. So he's he's always willing to compromise and work on the players' deficiencies or hide them. So say the recruitment department bring him a player and they'll say, well, they can't do that. He said, well, that's my job to either teach them how to do it or hide the fact that they can't do it. So he's not he's got realistic expectations about what he can bring in. And, and you can look... Everyone's a little bit different, right? If you look at our front players, Diaz, Jota, Salah, Mane, who are all the wide forwards, really, they're all a little bit different. So he just accepts them for what they are and then yeah. either works with the players or hides what they can't do. And then... Um, now he's he's very engaged in the in the recruitment the process and and he's he said hasn't he on record that uh i i i don't know every player in the world uh as well as the recruitment department do so why would i why would why i let them do what they're excellent at um but and and provide him with the shortlist of players to choose from but you, as it says earlier he always has a final say but that that became, that came, no, it takes years to get that trust, Gav. Mm -hmm. you know? So like that every time a player is presented and, you know, the, the, the back and forth between all levels of the recruitment team and Jürgen, uh, hearing what they've said and then time is a great teller of the truth, right? Mm -hmm. So what's happened over the years is because of the consistency of keeping the same manager, the consistency of tactics, the consistency of the recruitment team. There's a trust now. Yeah. Like an unbreakable bond and unbreakable trust where he's now like completely trusts the shortlist that's put in front of him. Yeah. So the last thing Gav is that is, is, is personality is like the perfect match with his uh, with his playing style. So I think that one of the things, so can you imagine, uh, I couldn't imagine, like Guardiola's team's press as well, and he's wound up energetic on the sideline. But you couldn't imagine like a, let's say a Roy Hodgson or a, who's more, who's more chilled, uh, like a, an Arsene Wenger, you know, running up and down the sideline, having his players press in, in the same way as the Liverpool team do. So I think that's a really important fact as well, that he's chosen a style of play that basically marries perfectly with his personality. Yeah. Heavy metal football, if you like. And if I can, I like this video, Gav. I had to put it in. Oh. Have a look.
So for me, Gav, right, I know we went go back to the beginning just to wrap this up. He said he, he wasn't the special one, he was the normal one. I, I think he is the special one by being normal. Uh, and and I also think that he's just, he is such a special manager. Not only his style of play, but the way, as you can see in that video, the way that he can connect emotionally with players as well, um, in a way that he can give them good and bad news, and they all still love him. Uh, you don't really hear anybody living leaving Liverpool and having bad words to say about Jurgen, whether they played or whether they didn't. And I think that really is, that really is, although he wants to be normal, it really is what makes him so special to us as Liverpool fans. You've been a manager. You 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 know how hard that balance is. I mean, yeah. is that something you've been able to replicate? Mate, I think it's, uh, you know, it's so natural to him. Um, is is like, I'm, mate, I'm, I'm like, I'm not a, I'm not a hugger, you know, even when we were growing up as kids, like you and your dad would hug and I'm like, fuck off. You know what I mean? Like, but your you know, dad's not a hugger. I, it, I, I don't know whether I've told you this, but I found it really interesting that after we won the Carabao Cup, now I know your dad's not a hugger at all, yeah, but yeah. Jürgen hugged him. Yeah. There's that lovely scene. Did you see it in the outside the bus? Oh, where yeah. Went, oh, that's that's working. Working. moment. That awkward moment. But did you see what my dad did first? He put his hand out to shake his hand, right? Like that. And Jürgen went like that and gave him a hug. And my dad was like, for a school kid. And he it was, oh, mate, it was so uncomfortable to watch that because I know how uncomfortable my dad is at hugging. You know what yeah. I mean? Whereas that's, so it was like, I think the emotional connection that he has, it's, that can only be natural. Because if I went round trying to hug people, they'd be like, why are you so stiff? You know what I mean? Why are you like a board? I, I, I'm not a hugger. Yeah, I am a hugger. Definitely. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. But no, yeah. I think, I think, uh, and I think that's why it's really important, Gav, that you've got to, you've got to be genuine. You've got to be honest. And if your style is hugging, then be a hugger. But the worst thing you could do is go and try and be a hugger when it's not natural because it, that just makes that that just that's a recipe for disaster. And we're talking about a hugger. We're not just talking about the hug thing. It's we're talking about that as a microcosm of the macrocosm that is Jurgen Klopp. His whole personality is so genuine and honest. He genuinely cares about the person first, yeah. and then he's an amazing manager at the same time in, in football terms. So, mate, just a privilege to have him as our manager, and and uh, I know we've not got much not long left with him as our manager. He's, I, I believe him when he says that he's going to step down, but it's just been a privilege to kind of look back at what he's done for the club and just looking forward to it lasting for however long it lasts. Well, we've got until 2024, I think. So, um, you know, we don't have to worry about it too much yet. But um, I'm still hoping that he's got he's he's already remolding this team into the next generation, and I wonder whether he might fancy having a little go with that. You don't I, think? I, yeah. I don't think he says things for effect. You know, he walked away from Dortmund when he. No, I don't think he, he says things for effect. I don't think he's saying that for effect. But he could change his mind. That's he could change his mind. But I don't think he will. I, if you gave me, if I had to bet on it, I would say that he probably take one more job, which would be the German national team, and then uh, retire. Mm. Yeah. But I'm, I, I don't know any... That, that, to be fair, this was put together with, you know, a little bit of of, of, of information that, uh, you know, that I put together, but I have no insight, Gav, into where he's going to go next. No, I know. And we, I don't think anyone does. I don't think anyone does. But that would be my guess. I think because it... It'd be hard for him to go to. It'd be hard for him to go to like a Real Madrid or a Paris Saint Germain, who who, you know, like to sign Galacticos, if you like. That doesn't mm. fit in with who he is. You know, I I don't see him going to buy and after being at Dortmund. I just think that the only thing that I could really see him doing if he doesn't stay at Liverpool is go to to German the German national team. I think that would Do be. Do you think not a national job would bore him though? Well, you get older, Gav. You know, like the, an international job as you get older is is uh, 
it's probably a lot more enjoyable rather than the day-to-day -day intensity of of and the media spotlight of the you know of, of the premier league mm. Well, listen, lovely. It was brilliant, mate. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. Obviously, you've done a lot of our work and uh, hopefully um, everyone's got a little insight from behind the curtain. Um, if you're watching this on uh, YouTube, we're now 7NWA. There's a video knocking around about explaining why we're now 7NWA and we've uh, we've changed from Ken 7. But uh, make sure you subscribe, make sure you let everyone know. Try and share it on your uh, this. Try and share this video on your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed. It'd be fantastic for uh, for people to watch. I think. And um, Paul, thanks very much for your time, Paul. And uh, we'll see you soon. No problem. Thanks, Gav.